Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Apple is one of the biggest and most powerful companies in the world. What goes on there inadvertently pretty much affects all of us. Someone who had recently started at Apple was sacked last week under intriguing circumstances that tell us quite a lot about the atmosphere in that company and in Silicon Valley more broadly. He joins us now from Silicon Valley. His name is Antonio Garcia Martinez. Hi, Antonio. Hello, thank you for having me. So you've had a few careers, it sounds like. You were a banker at Goldman Sachs. You were a senior executive in early, day, in early Facebook, writing code for their um, targeting and advertising software, I guess. Um, you then wrote a book. Um, which described Silicon Valley and the culture that you observed there. And then fast forward, that was back in 2012, and then fast forward a few years, you then got a new job at Apple. Except you don't have that job anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I've had a strange career. Yeah, I was uh, an early member of the Facebook ads team and all the weird, sketchy ads technology that would, you know, the pair of shoes that follow you around the internet. I built the, uh, the very early versions of that uh, for Facebook and uh, worked in tech a bit more and then wrote a memoir about it. I thought my time there uh, was uh, interesting. And I wrote a memoir in a very uh, hyperbolic, you know, gonzo journalist style, obviously over the top stylistically. Um, and it came out, it did well, you know, bestseller list, book of the year. And, you know, I kind of left that behind. Um, and yeah, I came back to tech and uh, I've been in tech actually for the past year and a half at another, at another startup. And I decided to continue my career at, at Apple. I, you know, I specialize in sort of data and privacy and ads targeting and all that, all that murky stuff. And uh, for the past month, yeah, I've been working there and I, you know, reconciled myself to quiet life of uh, a tech employee and uh, all this happened. So you had written a book back in 2016 called Chaos Monkeys that described your time at Facebook. It described the culture in Silicon Valley at the time. It was kind of a memoir written, as you say, in this gonzo journalist style. And it combined talk of your professional life with your personal life. It describes some of your girlfriends and what happened in your private life in a comedy way. Some quotes from that book were deemed unacceptable. Uh, anyone can Google them. They're pretty much uh, available everywhere. So there's no great secret, but we don't need to run through them all now. But they were considered unacceptable in today's climate. And that triggered a whole movement against you. I mean, again, to me, what's funny about this is this is all old news. I mean, it's not funny to me, but what I find ironic is that, um, you know, it's, it's an old book. <laughs> it's five years ago. And what's interesting, of course, is that Apple has pretended that, you know, this is somehow news and they didn't discover it. Of course, they knew it ahead of time. You know, this is an old book and um, Apple is sort of playing coy and kind of pretending they didn't know about uh, the book. But of course, they knew about it. I mean, they asked all my professional references about it, people very prominent in the Valley. Um, they absolutely knew about it. There's no way to not know about it. Right. I mean, this is this is that's not why they hired me. Obviously, they hired me for my tech expertise. And I I have this weird window or sort of island in my career it was on my CV it was on LinkedIn. There, there's no hiding this. There's no digging this out. This is not get dug out. Right. I mean, Apple knew all about it. Um, they acted surprised later. Um, but, you know, I would just quibble with that, that that characterization of it. So what then happened? So there was this quote in the book some years ago describing a, someone in a in a way that seemed derogatory. Then there were calls for resignation. You're already an employee at Apple at this point. What happened next? I can't actually discuss what happened when I was at Apple. That's the problem, right? I, I, I literally cannot. So, I mean, what's in the public record, you're free to read, right? I mean, apparently there was a petition circulated. But beyond that, I have no unique insight into that. Or if I did, I couldn't talk about it. So what, what would you like to say, Antonio? I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you feel has, what, what is, has this revealed to you? I mean, my story is nothing in the scheme of things, right? It's, I mean, I think... Broadly, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it means. I mean, I think there's. So, what does it say about the state of the world that you're now trying to have a new section of your career, and you don't seem to be able to move on from this line you wrote all those years ago? What... My my story in the scheme of things is is small, right? I think in general, if you look broadly at Silicon Valley, uh, what happened, for example, at Coinbase, the large cryptocurrency exchange, in which management basically had to say, "We're not discussing politics at work." And that's just the way it is. Uh, more recently, the CEO of Shopify, uh, Toby Lutka, um, issued a, basically the same statement, right? Um, Basecamp, which is another large, or not large, but prominent collaboration software company, also did the same, and half the company left. Um, so again, my, my story is small beans in the scheme. I mean, it's big to me, but it's not big in general. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think there's kind of a reckoning, I would say in corporate America more broadly and definitely in Silicon Valley around, you know, what does one do at work, right? The, you know, there's this kind of cliche about, you know, bring the real self, your, your real self to work, right? Which I find to be disingenuous. We don't we don't bring the real self to work, right? Like the conversation you would have, you and I would have over the third pint in a pub is not the pint that you and I would have as coworkers, right? We we don't bring the real self to work. That's that's a ridiculous notion, um, and so or, or notion that your company is family or that the company is in fact like the government that can actually solve social problems. I'm basically paraphrasing the the quote from the Shopify CEO actually who who literally said what I just said. And he's this nerdy guy, right? Who works at this Canadian company, you know, he's not exactly the hard charging, uh, you know, whatever your caricature is of a, of a tech entrepreneur. And um, yeah, I think there's just a reckoning that's happening there. And I think Apple has decided to go one way in that reckoning and that's. So basically the idea is then that so politics has just sort of infused it and there is no, there's no longer a, the ability for people to have any kind of private sphere or outside right. work views. But not just not just private, but you know, a person. I it sounds ridiculous to say is a multifaceted entity. You have everyone has a political side, a potentially religious side, you know, family side, whatever, right? Um, you know, the question is, again, that, I, again, I'm fra I'm framing it in sort of the bigger debates that have been had around Coinbase, for example. It's like, well, do you leave it at the door, do you not? Some would seem to think that no, you can't leave it at the door. That that is the whole me, and if I if I cannot bring that to work you're denying some aspect of me. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, I mean, there's no, it's, no one's denying that it's part of you. You can definitely do that off corporate hours, but it's just not part of corporate life. And we need to not include that in corporate life to be a productive profit-making entity, which is Toby's point of view. Um, that, I guess, I, to me, that's the debate here. I guess the, yeah. the, it gets more complicated when people are recording their thoughts, uh, either more commonly on Twitter or Facebook or social media, or in your case, in a book, but it's like, there's no statute of limitations. There's no point at which anything that you've That's ever right. written down ceases to become a prosecutable piece of evidence against you. Right. There's no statute of limitations, and clearly, uh, the ability to, the, the ability to contextualize that creative output or that other non-work output obviously varies in real ways. I mean, I don't think. I mean, look at the rap lyrics of uh, Dr. Dre, who's currently sitting on the Apple board. I mean, they're, in my opinion, absolutely putrid, <laughs> and yet there he is. Right. Um, uh, I don't. I don't see a lot of standing on principle here. I see a lot of activism, and those are not necessarily the same thing. So, where's it going to lead? I mean, do you, what happens next in this sort of journey? Because only people who have sort of been extremely careful about all of their public pronouncements and maybe even private pronouncements, because you could be recorded these days. But, but that's not even true. That's not even true, right? I mean, Doc, <laughs> Dr. Dre has not been careful on his public announcements, right? right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, either you're a saint or at least you seem like a saint or, yeah, I mean, I, look, I, nobody knows anything. I, I can't claim to understand where the world is going all this, but it, it does seem to me that we're in a, in a strange world in which, you know, you've got this social media that almost seems like oral media, like you and me in a pub, and yet it's infinitely searchable in a way that, you know, oral, more casual media is not. Um, and uh, it's an odd just position to be in. And uh, leaving that aside again, where does this leave culture, right? I mean, if in some sense, um, if you're an artist or whatever, or a writer, and you have to, every word you write, you have to project forward 20 years of politics to imagine whether it's acceptable or not, you know, what sort of art would you end up with? I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of 20th century political movements that you can cite that thought that art should always be in service to politics. And those political movements did not end up, you know, things did not end up pretty either artistically or politically in those movements. And one of and those so again, one of those movements was communism. Uh, and correct. as I understand it, your well, at least one of your parents fled from communist Cuba to arrive in America. Is that true? That is right. Yeah, my parents were Cuban exiles. My father came with you know nothing in his pocket, and he came through the Cuban Refugee Center in Miami. And uh, I was born in the U.S. and raised in Miami, which was very much a Cuban exile city. And uh, that's right. I mean, <laughs> communism is an all-encompassing uh, philosophy in which everything is in service of the state and the party. And uh, again, I think that that's a very dangerous trend or a very dangerous expectation for culture. The, the Verge ran a, as part of this kind of media pylon that was happening, uh, The Verge quoted, said, quote, Silicon Valley has consistently had a white male workforce um, in reference to your case. Uh, do, you, do you consider yourself white? <laughs> 
at this point, I, you know, I, I'm not going to play a role in the whole, you know, race culture game. But I, I, it, I find it, I find it funny, and in fact, it's empirically false to claim that you know most of Silicon Valley is white. I mean, it, it's simply not true. Um, and I think anyone who's actually worked in, in much of tech realizes that it's not true. I, I find it odd to interject the whole racial politics of it into tech, to be quite honest. Um, but in any case, I, I do find it. Yeah, I mean. If, if you ask me, do I find it funny that presumably a Latino minority who managed to like make it up the ranks is getting assailed by a bunch of white people who have strong ideas about whatever their politics? Yeah, I do find it pretty ironic, actually. But uh, you know, beyond that, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I, I have I have no insight, no unique insight to offer there. So our viewers will be really interested to know what your take on the culture in Silicon Valley is more generally now, because you spend a lot of time at Facebook. You're now about to go back into Apple, or that, that didn't last long. You know, what is, what is the culture in those companies? Is it, is it, a, is it awkward? Is, are people being insincere? Do people live in fear? Is it a weird place to work? What's it like? It is, it is an interesting weird world. I mean, I, I, don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a particularly shocking statement to say that companies like Facebook and indeed Apple are somewhat cultish. And I, and I don't mean that necessarily a bad way, right? Um, I think it was Keith Raboy, a famous VC, who said that every successful startup is a cult. Um, and in some sense, you have to. You have to have this religious faith in what the company is doing, because uh, often there's <laughs> there's real doubts about whether the company is going to succeed. And it's a, it's a motivating factor. I think people people want to change the world in what they do. And, I, I, and I, I'm not being cynical about it. I, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you can question the mission of a Facebook, say, if you don't like the company. But broadly, yeah, I mean, tech companies are as much faith-based institutions as they are capitalistic ones. Well, faith and political. So I guess the question is, if, if you get can be canceled in the way that you have uh, at a company like Apple. Am I canceled? What does cancellation mean? <laughs> well, you, you, were, you lost your job as a result of a, 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 some sort of campaign. That's a, sort right. of, that's a textbook cancellation, I would say. But, okay. you know, what hap what's the online version of that? You know, we talk a lot about censorship, about what Facebook is doing. You were there in the weeds of writing the code. Should we, yep. as normal people using these platforms, be worried that there are similar kind of political cautionary areas in the actual platforms themselves? Back in my writer days, um, I was writing all about this, right? That um, the calls for Facebook to moderate, censor, choose your verb, uh, media in you know 2016 post Trump, I thought were dangerous, right? I mean, appointing Zuckerberg editor in chief of the world um, seems to be like a rather dangerous development, right? I mean, <laughs> at some point the editor comes for you. Um, and is that is that what's yeah. happening now? Do you think? Do you think? Do you think within the algorithms, which you probably understand better than we do, do you think there are? Now, all right, just to be clear, I, I, the algorithm thing that's like this boogeyman that gets raised from non-technical people that they assume the algorithm is like this Terminator robot's coming and killing them. I think it's a lot less about the Terminator. I think it's a lot less about the algorithm. I think it's a lot more about the, whatever it's called, the content moderation council at Facebook, that behind closed doors, not, and I'm using Facebook, but basically every sort of social media company now, right? Um, behind closed doors that adjudicates some content policy and says, this is good and this is bad, et cetera. That, that's really what I'm referring to. That to me is what I consider dangerous. Like a Supreme Court of Facebook that you know decides what we read and see. Um, I don't know. It seems suboptimal to me. Of course, the flip side of that is there's always. I can picture the my former opponents in this debate, of which I've had many, um, would say, "Well, there's always been moderation on social media, which is true. We don't want to see pornography. We don't want to see illegal activities. True. I mean, there's no absolute First Amendment right in any of these platforms, right? Which I agree. Um, Trump, for example, the expulsion of the president as I mean, he then was. Do you have a view on that? I, I, have, I don't have a view on Trump. I'm, no, on, <laughs> on, I'm, on, his, on his exclusion from all of the platforms in the same week. Look, I'm not gonna, I, I have no view on, on Trump. But my view, however, is that it, I, I do think that there is somewhat unsettling development that a lot of these companies do have a lot of sway in what we see and we don't see. And um, I get it, sometimes that's good. Again, there has to be a certain amount of content moderation online. There absolutely has to be, right? But where do you draw the line? It's hard to say. It's, it's odd to me that typically the government made these decisions, right? It was typically the government restricting things and then you know the literary world or the business world kind of expanded beyond that and the government, big bad government would come in and shut things down, right? Lenny Bruce being pulled off the stage or whatever, right, back in the day. And now it's been inverted, right? In some sense, the government isn't doing anything. <laughs> it's really corporations that are stepping in due to public pressure. And um, it, yeah, it's an odd inversion to me because, of course, you know, 
as the people who say you don't have a First Amendment right on Facebook, well, it's not the government. It's the public, either private company that can do whatever they want, which is, of course, true. Mm. Um, but I would question if, I mean, that's, of course, legally true. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's weird that we're arguing against corporations following what we consider to be core First Amendment freedoms. <laughs> um, so it sounds like a libertarian argument. Um, well, yeah, the, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the absolute free speech argument, which I'm not advocating myself to be clear mm. with. Because again, I don't think there's an absolute First Amendment free speech right on, on platforms. There's, there has to be moderation. So Antonio, what, what's next for you then? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know, it's too early to say. I can't, I can't quite tell you. I mean, I, I don't know, to be honest. This is presumably a, a, a big deal in your life to suddenly be let go like this. Yeah, um, I guess so. Too early to say. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I you know I was <clears throat> hoping to. Um, there's a lot going on in the, the field that I work in, right? And I was hoping to be at Apple and uh, work on it and build something new and you know retire not retire but go back to a quieter life than uh, the book writer. I mean, I'd already done it again. Like I've, I've been in tech back now for like a year and a half, so this isn't exactly totally novel. But this is definitely you know big company, slow um, but impactful. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it's disappointing. Um, you know, I, I still think Apple is an amazing company and what they're doing, the moves they're making in ads and privacy, which is what I was hired to work on, I think are super interesting and super impactful. Like that whole debate that's going on between Apple and privacy and what's called the IDFA and the war with Google, like that whole world is going to undergo a complete re-architecture, like a once in 20 year type situation. So the fact that I won't participate in that is definitely a problem, you know, it's definitely disappointing. And then, yeah, broadly, I mean, the damages to me, I mean, the, you know, their, their defamatory statement about behavior and all that, um, which came out, which is, of course, ludicrous. There was no behavior at Apple that was questionable. It was simply the petition and the Slack message threads or whatever came out in that public piece. Um, you know, that's obviously upsetting um, mm. and, you know, obviously financially damaging. Um, but, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, Antonio, thanks for telling us about it. Thank you for having me. That was Antonio Garcia Martinez. Until last week, an employee of Apple. No longer. He has been sacked. And he was telling us a little bit about the circumstances and sharing some reflections on the state of culture there in Silicon Valley. As you could see, he was kind of nervous, as I guess you would be when you're in the middle of a firestorm like that, dealing with great powers. So thanks to him for taking the time to talk to us. This was Lockdown TV.